All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to yet another episode of the Cosmic Wizard Show, the show for astrology nerds by astrology nerds. And I am continuing, we, I should say, are continuing our series. I'm here with Michael Hart again from One Sky Astro, continuing our series about um, <clears throat> true sidereal, aka constellational oppositions. Um, if we're talking sort of classic mainstream astrology, every sign has one sign that they oppose, the end, that's it. And if we use the actual sizes of the constellations it it lends a little bit more nuance there's some additional things to look at and this particular one that we're looking at today actually does only have one opposition but we're gonna we're gonna dig into it because today we're talking about um scorpio and a fucus which we're sort of going to talk together about in a pair um and and hello Michael. welcome hey rio hey star fam nice to be back it seems like I've been gone from doing YouTube stuff and it's just nice to nice to feel nice to feel present again. Mm, that's awesome. Are you gonna start doing your lunar cycle videos again? Yeah, yeah. Not not one for December, but for January there will be. Yeah, I'm on track to get that started up. So I'm pretty excited. <laughs> oh nice. Well, I'm sure. Yeah. People are looking forward to that. Oh, thank you. I just wanted to start today by just taking a look at the stars, right? Because the Fucus and Scorpio are quite intertwined. So if we could maybe take a look at the stellarium. Of oh, that. yeah. Get that, get that view. Mm. Just... Right, so here we go. We got Scorpio over here and Terry's. A few guess. We got the sun right. sort of smack dab in the middle right now. Um, right. The sun the sun's here in in a few guess. And uh you know you can see why we're talking about a fucus and Scorpio in the same in the same sort of podcast here. They're sharing a lot of real estate along the ecliptic, and the ecliptic is uh let's see this this is virgo libra scorpio uh scorpio fucus and sag and capricornus and so on out that way so yeah right, right now we have a lot of action the sun's here venus and mercury are here but we can get a good we can get a good view mm -hmm. of the sky we're in the section where the milky way is and this what we have highlighted here is the galactic center uh, astronomically named sagittarius a star it's super massive black, black hole at the it's like where our galaxy was birthed from in theory yes in the, in sort of a mayan creation epic yeah the, the the creation and the population of life on earth sort of emanate from this this sort of source of consciousness the sort of world system at the at the center of the milky way galaxy right the mayans called it jabalba and it, it was their underworld and uh we we today associate uh scorpio and some people a fucus with the underworld processes um scorpio is associated with planet pluto who's a lord of the underworld and mythology and uh okay. to have a strong association it's an area of the sky that's uh tends to be darker and somber and more challenging yeah. um with greater rewards deeper intensity richer <laughs> richer vistas <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> do you find i do find the you know Scorpio is sort of associated with um, like Scorpion, Eagle, Phoenix mm -hmm. sort of mm -hmm. storyline, shall we say. And right. I do feel like once we move into the, the Fucus area of the sky, we're getting a little bit more into the Phoenix zone. At least that's how I always feel. Or I should say that's how I've felt like the past couple years actually observing it. I feel like mm -hmm. there's definitely mm -hmm. a more energy yeah. yeah able to well, act there's, 
whereas in the Scorpio stars, it's a little bit like you're pinned down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get the very earthbound. Scorpio is very, yeah, very real, very earthbound. And the Fucus does have a sort of a, a, a phoenix quality to it. And I think there's a lot there to unpack that we might we might talk about during this episode. But the sort of de the the death and rebirth or that that happens around the galactic center as as planets pass it. It's sort of a uh, a point that you could start a, a cycle from if you needed if you needed any given point that it's gonna have like one method of expression that whole way around one primary method you know and then when the planet passes that you tend to see a little bit it mutate this even the planet for the next cycle around will have so the galactic center is very powerful and shapes the expression that oh. is interesting. That's something that I've like tossed around as an idea a lot. We have all this like death rebirth happening mm. in that Scorpio sounds... and Afucus, and then bam, there's the galactic center. It seems almost like the natural end start of the cycle, you know? The the natural end start of the cycle is a really interesting idea. I've actually toyed with like house systems like what if Sagittarius right. was correlate to the first house or what if another way of saying that maybe for people uh or maybe maybe for anyone another I'm sorry to interrupt but let's like, just let's just pop our faces back on while we're chatting oh yeah that's that's the goodness people people aren't watching this to see to see a fucus's <laughs> kneecap are they real <laughs> <laughs> no maybe. We got it if they needed it. That's hey, sure. I don't shame if you're into it for a fucus's kneecap. Get it? It's 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 a great it's a great kneecap. But Rhea, one of the one of the things I've been thinking about um for a while now actually it's just sort of a back burner kind of concept is like what if the stages of development what mm. if the stages of development of a cycle started with Sagittarius and then so so in Sagittarius we have this like big expansive emergence it's almost like uh, i mean uh, you could you could look at it um in various different ways but it's easy to correlate it to a new beginning it has, it has that same that curiosity quality to it of, too, of yeah. aries yeah, yeah yeah and it's just it's just got a, it's just got a an and and it's not explosive but it's just dynamic and outgoing energy shares that with what we're familiar with Aries is sort of so it's like a sort of easy start and you can start to pull you know draw all these threads but but eventually um I almost wonder if Sagittarius doesn't doesn't represent some kind of gestation period if we're talking about life cycles or even just like because it's the idea of something it's the dream of something right so you have these motivations you have you know like you were saying the natural curiosity that Sag Gemini share but yeah, and then you have Capricorn, you have to deal with the real limitations of it. I mean, and, you know, I mean, maybe that could me, be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes me think a little bit like, um, you know, because like Sag sort of has this connection to truth and that can get mm -hmm. that can get distorted a little bit. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, it's there's definitely like a lust for learning and just like wanting to understand the world. And I That's feel like funny. in a lot of ways, like that cat, that does kind of remind me of babies. And then like, mm -hmm. bam, we hit Capricorn and like, hello, right, actual right, schooling. Right. Don't touch the stove. Right, right, yeah, right. Yeah, then there's yeah, Capricorn. Exactly. And then, right. Then you have Aquarius, which is really, that would correlate with like the development of ego or the emergence of like your, your sort of genius higher self. And then. I mean, but 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 it does it does sort of start to start to fall away. And but it's through examining different and alternative models that um I've come to see the value and why is this correlate with the first house just in that like psychological development. But in the in the development of the expression of planets, like Saturn moved past the galactic center and like Ah, I want to say like late 2014, 2015. And in 2016, you know, what we saw was like the rise of authoritarian leaders in Bolsonaro in Brazil and um, 
you know, but I think Poland saw the rise of far right. We're still seeing it in Italy. We had, you know, of course, uh, Trump in the United States and this whole just people expressing a different kind of Saturn, right? Rulership, authority, leadership, totally different kind than had gone on before. And that's the kind of effect that passing the galactic center seems to have. It's with any planet, it's just a new expression. It doesn't make things darker. It doesn't make things more authoritarian. That was just that was just that time around. It seems to have been the effect. But it does like always have a sort a of shedding of skins, right? I feel like that's that was just like the prep work for Saturn and Pluto coming together, maybe. It and that you know, you, and you start to draw those patterns, and then and then right, and then when you're looking at it like that, really, you start to see more how the whole thing is fitting together and playing yeah. out because they did have a, of course, they had a lot to do with each other. But I don't want to get <laughs> we're getting off track. Into that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay. So bringing it back to. Scorpio and a few kiss. You said that you had a yeah. few notes. Do you want to start with the notes or shall we work into those? Well, you know, I think Scorpio Fucus just deserves special attention. And I think that everyone would benefit if we just took a little, took a little maybe time to unpack it, because I think this is the hardest area of the sky to understand. Mm -hmm. It's one that um, I'm still sort of working to understand myself. I, me too. I mean, whole books, you know, whole I mean, it's the core. It's the core. Uh, it's the core mechanic of, you know, evolutionary astrology. The the idea of of metamorphosis, tr evolutionary transformation, and for anyone who's interested in like depth insight, that's but Scorpio really insight, getting in, seeing the inner mechanics of something, not just what's on the surface, but apprehending the the deeper dynamics at work that's a scorpio thing so um and the confusing nature of its ruler pluto has been you know said to rule scorpio in modern times and let's leave aside for now that there's no that there's no really consensus on the rulership of a fucus true and i just yeah. want to mention that mars and pluto have been given rulership of Scorpio. And I think Pluto in particular is just very hard to understand. I do also think uh, whenever I'm talking about a Scorpio, about Scorpio, I do like to mention the traditional rulership too, because I think that mm. there is that, mm. you know, even that penetrating quality that you're talking about. That's it. it. Yeah. It's very Martian. Very, it is very, very much alive. And and Mars and Pluto, they share a resonance. Uh, like Pluto is considered uh, in in all the octave theories, the higher octave of Mars. I've never seen it tried to be presented as anything else except uh, where Mars is like the representing the conscious desires and the conscious motivations, aspirations. Pluto is like those just deep compelling soul level desires so pluto is like what drives you when you don't know who's driving <laughs> and when you when you've lost control or like you know pluto's pluto's still driving pluto's the driver right yeah and i feel like as a as a what's the word i'm looking for like not quite motivation but i can i guess that'll work as a stand-in mm -hmm. whatever word i'm thinking you know yeah. Pluto's motivation is ultimately just to like bring you through these steps of evolution mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it doesn't really care like it doesn't care if it does it gently if you like yeah, it if yeah. you're enjoying yourself along the way like yeah. the, the end result is like more important than if like it has to burn your house down to do it you know yeah, yeah, yeah. Uranus and Pluto, the planets that act to catalyze change, they don't mm -hmm. care much about our feelings. It's unfortunate. No. It's really sad. But I think but one of the confusing... Like sometimes it needs to happen that way, too. And sometimes there's, like, beauty and perfection seems, in that. Yeah. yeah, and when we look back, there's often there seems to be a medicine about that, right? There mm. seems to be a goodness about that process. Like, like even think, think about the, like, level of clarity we can get in, like, states of deep grief you know yeah sometimes it yeah, only needs yeah. to be pulled away 
or even just when you're in a yes. bad mood it doesn't take it doesn't take necessarily the loss or you know a, a, an earth-shaking you know cataclysm in 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 your personal life to to do this but it just do you ever feel real and i'm i feel like i'm sort of preaching to the choir here but i'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna ask anyway do you yeah. ever feel like when you're in a bad mood there's just more sobriety more clarity more like focus you're more real and more like level when you're just grumpy um like less naive not necessarily actually okay. but i've got okay. i've got a lot of jupiter influence in me too oh, so. okay so i think that that yeah. um sometimes like pushes me into uh more more on the like consistently that's it, that's it. optimistic scale of things that's it jupiter would offset jupiter would offset that that yeah. process i but but yeah i'm glad i asked i'm glad i asked um i did want to say i did want to say about pluto it's about finding that balance thing, say again i said really it's about finding the balance right because i pluto? find uh no just like between uh, when we're talking about like finding that like sobriety in like a mental sort of way yeah, yeah you yeah. know because yeah we yeah. can it's like the balance i think of, Ju of jupiter and saturn right you because yeah. we can't lean one way or the other or we fall off we can't yeah we exactly can't stay. yeah rather than so like we punisher need, mode we need or the... fantasy <laughs> right right that's just it yeah you took the word so i'll just let you <laughs> i'll just let you stamp that yeah that's that's it um but but I've been wanting I've been trying to 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 express a thing and it's it's a little bit it's a little bit difficult to express for how for how easy the words are where Pluto is really expressing itself and so Scorpio is also expressing itself in polarities mm. in and of itself it takes things and it separates them to the extremes yeah. right so it's not in the middle it's not like if it's if there's a bell curve pluto's right. always going to take things to the edge of the bell curve and really focus there so um scorpio is about a lot of stuff and it's all like really compelling and and, and dynamic but it's always going to express in polarity and that makes it really really hard to understand yeah. um so we can understand scorpio in in opposition to Taurus too, um, but but one of the, one of the things I I I have some Scorpio Fucus buzzwords I could just sort of rattle them off and you could kind of yeah, you know you could bounce off that we could talk about Scorpio Fucus because I think that's just a mystifying part of the sky so like the higher the higher higher expressions of it or insight like i talked about you know penetrative understanding like psychological insight not just cutting into things but surgery too but you have commitment mm -hmm. sex magic alchemy and transformation and right away like how how do those how do those things go together scorpio and the eighth house and pluto always seem about a bunch of stuff that doesn't go together yeah it's, it's like wait a minute is there even a common thread and, and then when and we bring in the eighth house like oh other people's money and resources it starts to yeah, get very right. like because it is it is it's totally it's totally outside resources but yeah it's also resourcefulness yeah you know it's resourcefulness and that's something it shares with taurus actually we're yeah, talking true. about we're talking yeah. before we recorded about how few things are shared across scorpio taurus polarity so Scorpio is ruling things that fascinate us, things that like really mm. compel us, right? And it's basically those intense catalytic experiences that push us to evolve, to transform into something new, right? To shed a skin and do a metamorphosis. Yeah. Even though a snake, when it sheds its skin, is really still a snake. And Scorpio governs something even more catalytic than that it's the it's the idea that a caterpillar could change into a butterfly that is a scorpio process where a snake shedding skins is like it's sort of a metaphor for this you know not like every time not every time we deal with scorpio will we die yeah but we will change and a lot of times it's asking for us to shed the old let the old die it wants some kind of death it wants some kind of sacrifice yeah right? it does and I like how you bring on like the caterpillar butterfly because like in order for the caterpillar to turn into a butterfly, it has to like 
goofify it. You yeah, know. it does. It turns itself to soup. If for those who don't know that, when you when you see a chrysalis and then and then there, it's not just a caterpillar sprouting little wings. It turns into soup and somehow genetically reassembles itself as a butterfly. That's right. That's what's happening to my brain right now. Yeah, you know that is that's the breakdown mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. precedes the rebirth. That's the death. It's because in order for something to become a butterfly, it can't be mm-hmm. a caterpillar anymore. The caterpillar must yeah. die. The skin, yeah. we could say the skin is shed and then a new, a whole, but in this, we're talking of metamorphosis, right? A whole new form is taken. And Pluto and Scorpio have the power to do that. This is very, and I like. Mm-hmm. I like that you use the word fascin, like what fascinates us, right? Because mm-hmm. I think that yeah. that's like really perfect and like not a buzzword we hear very often, but I think it really right. speaks to just the heart of it. Like, yeah. yeah. I personally, well, I was I talking really about have... the high, I was talking about the higher angles, right? Because we yeah. hear about, oh, it's Pluto and Scorpio is really about fixation and obsession and compulsion and all this it's creepy stuff. That, and, though, and it right? Is. Like, I personally don't have, like, I don't have any Scorpio placements, really. But mm-hmm. I do have quite a, like, Mars-Pluto 8th house situation. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The thing that, like, my sort of take on Scorpio has always been that, like, it goes, like, it's not just obsession. Like, sure, it tends to, like, take us in those sort of, like, darker ways. So I feel like saying that like it's those like obsessive sort of like things that we can't help is a bit of like an easy um how do I put this like like it's an easy way to categorize it but I feel like really like fascination is a much better word for it because it's that like sort of primordial drive that wants to bring us in contact with experiences that that we want to have even though yeah, we know yeah. and perhaps even because right, we right. know it could destroy us right right fascination is a weird thing it's not always like, positive right even like yeah. certain levels of love are like that you sure, know sure and that's where scorpio gets ruling commitment and gets ruling like sexual union and the the really the depths of 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 merging experiences i mean we're talking about bliss experiences in which egoic boundaries are obliterated and transcended and scorpio seeks that sort of like merging or to merge with the divine the cosmos whatever that's a scorpio on a courage um so and like really in our fascination framework. can really drive us and i wanted to just say while you were on that it brings uh, another aspect of all this into into the conversation, which is a fucus, which has uh, a, a well-deserved reputation for being mesmerizing and and sort of a uh, hypnotic, hypnotic. The snake charmer hypnotizes the snake. Yeah, that's with movement. It's a body thing. So this is really increasing the depth of Scorpio's mythology, which I always, I always try to look at a fucus since we have such an established Scorpio mythology. I always try to look at a fucus in the context of that. And then one of the ways that it's separate from that is, is that Ross Hogg, this uh, star at the head of the, I can, I can, I can put it back on the screen if you don't mind, just for a minute yeah, yeah, to show people show people what I'm talking about. So here um, here we have the snake charmer, a fucus holding serpents, uh, the snake, and the star at the charmer's head, this is called Ras al Hog, the head of the snake charmer, the head of the serpent bear. And it's associated with mesmerism, hypnotism, and the quality of just being like compel, almost like addictive to watch that person move. That's like a strong Russell. And this came up because it's prominent in Michael Jackson and Lady Gaga's charts just recently oh, okay. in some discussion we were both part of. So 
Yeah, all of that, all of that part of the same sort of mythology of this area of the sky. I think that's the, I think that's the gist. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, have, one, I have one more little thought I, I want to get out. Because we were talking yeah. about polarities and how sometimes it's hard to, uh, how it's hard to bring them together. And this mm -hmm. idea that like, it's about evolution and wanting to like find these transcendence experiences mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then like that it's about death can mm -hmm. feel sort of separate but at the end of the day like within our framework and experience of life like how do we how do we find god do we have to die in order to do it there's a right right that's a great question and and i think we I do think we i do. think i mean we could take god up yeah metaphorically, go ahead, please yeah and, right right it, i think we could take i think we i'm sorry i'm sorry I, I think you froze and i thought you were done and then you were still talking go go um, ahead say say that thought again because i didn't get it um starting from okay so like do we need to die in order to like find god hmm. maybe not like necessarily mm -hmm. literally right mm -hmm. but there not is literally right like something programmed in our brain that's like that's how we get back you know that's yeah and i mean level. and 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 even if you look in you know the the public domain and mm -hmm. in non-mystical writings just writings for everyone like please mm -hmm. here this is how you do it you know I don't want to, I don't want to diminish non-mystical traditions, but when you have a public tradition like Christianity, they're not exposing all the deep spiritual mechanics and the, and the, and the inner secret materials. And even there we find that no one can actually, you know, enter into that mental state that is the kingdom of heaven. No one can enter into that state of being that, that union with God, um, unless they are well, like, why is it like born again, which a lot of people took as to mean they had to, the Holy Spirit had to come into them. And then that that would like be a, a whole spiritual journey, a process of unfolding, almost similar. And some people would even tell you that it's correlate to the Kundalini journey of yoga. Mm -hmm. um, sure. And all and all of that was to all of that was a death. All of that was the death you call born again. Well, the person you were becomes obsolete. And then, you, you know, everyone who has these experiences, whether it's with the Kundalini or the Holy Spirit, the Mayans called it uh, Kapoya, the blood lightning. Every culture has this knowledge of like a, a rebirth, like right? That. Blood lightning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's interesting. It might be Koyopa, might be Koyopa, the Mayan yeah. word. I'm not a mind scholar. I've mentioned them twice, but I'm not. I'm not a mind scholar, so I want to be yeah humble about that. Um, well, but it's yeah, interesting mentioning you cut, it, you cut it, Rio. Death and rebirth. Mm -hmm. Letting something end is like a part of the sky that demands a sacrifice. It is. It is interesting, and it, and it's ruling also like intimacy and vulnerability. So that's weird too. You throw that in the mix, you have a very weird mix and power and all the taboo topics and secrets and the macabre, right? And then and then this is where it gets confusing because, because polarity and extremes are the way Pluto expresses. So it won't just express on one end of a thing. It won't just be, oh, that's really intensely like uh, macabre. It'll so, so so here I have a list of like ways. So so the, of the things I just said. So for vulnerability, Pluto and Scorpio ruling actually vulnerability and intimacy. We also have it ruling abuse and violation and betrayal. That yeah. these are Scorpio experiences. And for its ruling intimacy, we have sexual violence. Like this is this is the same area of the sky that that depending on how you see things here, they can they can they can manifest in our level of experience like this. And it's famous for power, right? We have power. Scorpio is about power. It's about powerlessness too. You will learn about power and powerlessness in Scorpio. It will, there's no one without the other. So this is one of the very difficult things to understand about Scorpio and Pluto is it separates things into extremes. 
for every time we see the taboo and the secret in a good way, right? And we get to uncover and like learn something. Wow, it was hidden from us. And now I have it. You see paranoia, right? The spooky molder, the spooky molder, you know, complex where you just can't even go have a pint at the pub without thinking, oh my God, they're watching me. Like, what kind of life is that? I've been there. You can't do that. Phobias, corrupt power, all that. Um, so, so it's ruling all the extremes and for the macabre you see genuine evil you see it in scorpio you see it and i don't want to whitewash that yeah fair fair so thanks for letting me get all all that out it's it's just so confusing to try and put all that in one place it doesn't fit in one place you have to understand the dichotomous and the polarizing and the extreme nature of this influence this set of stars in order to begin to kind of put together what it could be mm -hmm. well and actually i think when you were bringing up christian uh, christianity that's an interesting segue into a fucus a little bit right because according oh, to yeah. uh like the different dogmas and different sort of like human takes on things you know oh maybe we need the holy spirit to come in maybe we need to be born again right mm -hmm. and if you like take a look at the sort of things that like Jesus is actually credited right, right. having said you know he says like all this and more you can do like right, it's within right. all of us you know and I think that this theme is really big and alive in a fucus because it's that sort of point where we experience the extremes and then like find the place where we can sort of like spin it into alchemy within ourselves yeah uh, like and it's so often like gold a, yeah and it's, and it's so often like a trial by fire or like a quest mm -hmm. or some kind of like challenge that we have to overcome mm -hmm. yeah i think i think it's uh i feel like this like theme of like it was within you all in the beginning is is quite alive in a fucus right right the right right yeah. or but that's that's the serpent power. That's that's what it's that's what it's always been because the spiritual power that moves through people um in the in the Indo-Himalayan tradition was always like a you know analogous to serpent, the kundali, that literally means coiled like a snake. Um and the idea that this thing moved in spirals and just kind of wanted to climb mm -hmm. the spine and settle here and that that represented a sort of access to higher consciousness from our sort of what was trapped in a lower earthbound consciousness all of this was part of the christian mystery and those people who were doing authentic mystical christianity they're they're you can there's there's still enclaves in, on islands off of greece where greek orthodox do like this the straight up old school like inner alchemy and they they want to become christ christ is the word it means anointed right and if you can the serpent process this i mean what do you think is the anointment like in it's not oil. That's easy. Anyone can get the oil. You need to be anointed by the white of the of the spirit, whether you see it as the serpent over the over the head of someone who's awakened their their energy centers, or you see it just in the form of a fucus that the the serpent bear has mastered that energy and, and is holding it. There, there, there. It's a love relationship. You can't handle a massive serpent unless you can relate to it. There's a volatile animal, right? A creature, I should say. So all of that, yeah, is definitely it's it's in there. And a fucus is, I think, one of the keys to that mystery. In 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 the Vedic, a fucus was a, was a, a um, constellation that was correlated, they saw it correlate to the Shakti, the the spiritual power that flowed in the universe, mm -hmm. and across the sky across the ecliptic yeah, so right between taurus and gemini but south of the ecliptic we're here we're north so it's very much opposite in the sky you have orion who is the hunter and um in the vedic there's a correlation between that and shiva so the shiva shakti the spiritual power the masculine feminine sort of yin yang of this whole thing is 
all all of that is part of the mythology of Ephucus. So we're going to like, I mean, death and God and 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 the spiritual power, right? The whole the spirit that moves through people, like what it just goes to all of that. So there's no easy way to just like gloss this topic or like really discover in like half an hour, an hour, like what is Scorpio Ephucus? You have to actually have those intense experiences, I think, to discover. Mm -hmm. Like, you can tell a child the stove is hot, but it doesn't mean anything to them until they touch the stove, right? Yes. Scorpio Fucus is like an that. iron. <laughs> yeah. Whole hand. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Uh, mm. One of my first memories, actually. <laughs> ah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm hmm. One of my, my first mem my first memory was like walking off the edge of a of a boat. My first steps is I don't remember much before that. I remember a couple things before that, but I remember my first steps, and I happened to actually be uh, out with my grandparents, and and they had retired uh, and and bought a little like a pontoon boat. Um, you just walked right and the off? family was out there, and it's and I was just sitting there, and they weren't they weren't thinking, oh, he's going to take his first steps. I took my first steps. I walked right off the edge of that boat. My dad caught me. Nice. Well, that's yeah, good. I remember that vividly because everyone was like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> my first steps were like, "Let's go swimming." So I, I mean, I was kind of born this way, you know, like, but yeah, <laughs> just kind of <laughs> just came out looking for the line. I thought I thought I'd go see what would happen when I crossed it. So yeah, yeah, this feels very on point for this discussion. <laughs> cool. That's how I got here. It's really how I got to constellational astrology and truth I do. Mm -hmm. Across those lines. <laughs> but yeah, Rio, back to back to Scorpio Fucus, you know, in the in and 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 I wanna say And you're bringing up Orion. Prior, what's that? You were bringing up Orion too, but sorry, go go with what you're going with. Thanks, thanks. I will I would like to get to Orion more in the relationship between Orion and Ephucus. It helps to understand Ephucus and helps to understand Scorpio. Um, but what I wanted to say is that in the prior in the prior looking at the signs, you and I had talked about them as processes. And we looked at Scorpio, uh, if we look at Scorpio Fucus in that light, like what they want, we already talked about metamorphosis and shedding skins and leaving something behind and like embarking on a new beginning. But um, I think one of, one of the things that Scorpio Fucus wants is to like really just have its mind blown. I really mean that it seeks those experiences that are like that are like shattering, transcendental, like recatalytic of like mutation on a genetic. I'd like to bring the genetic correlate into it because Pluto does rule genetics like Scorpio seeks such intensity. And this is what's weird about it. It wants things to be like that because it knows it will like springboard it on its evolutionary process. And Having think, combined that with what we already mentioned, that Pluto doesn't care, Mars doesn't care, these factors don't care about your feelings. It's easy to see how we could get ourselves in and get fascinated, you know, and we have to be careful. One of the things we learn throughout the process of it is just be careful what you wish for, right? Because you might get it. Yeah. <laughs> I think it, you know, and we started things off by saying that there isn't really a consensus as far as what the ruler of a fucus is that's true um but while you're talking about how like they want their mind to be blown and they want that sort of just like expansive experience i do think it is worth saying that uh walter berg attributed a fucus with the rulership of pluto and jupiter pluto and jupiter I think it's definitely, I mean, I think anything Walter Berg said is worth repeating, uh, just for just for the record. And I think yeah. that uh, myself, I see enough Pluto in a fucus and in Russell Hogg, and then I don't see enough deviation from Pluto. Is he to, no, 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 I get it. I get it. But I'm saying that I don't see enough deviation from Plutonic themes and a fucus to give it 
to total rulership to anyone else because Eris would be my or Karen Eris or Karen would be Karen is Pluto's moon is a massive body relative to Pluto's size and they're they're a dual planet I say this all the time they have a sort of dual orbit they don't they, you know Pluto's moon isn't spinning around Pluto they're I see so you could give you could give you could you could read a lot into that if you wanted to say oh well that is a that is a sort of bifurcated energy right a sort of dualistic a sort of a you know mm -hmm. uh, already we have we have an energy that's very dark and polarized but I think Jupiter is like the spiritual guru that does bring the a few can qualities of like spiritual mastery and depth and the and the connection to that sort of like divine intelligence the big mind yeah i think that's great i always feel a little bit of an energy lift too you mm. know it's like a little bit of a yeah. it's almost as if you know if we're like seeking some sort of truth which i feel like if we're looking for transcendent experiences looking for that like touch of god like that's what we're looking for at the heart of it, right? Is looking for truth. It makes sense yeah. that we got to experience all the way on this side and all the way on this side in right, order to right, like right. figure out what's like How can you know, how can you know the truth if you, if you haven't really seen like the, the, the weird expressions of it, the extreme expressions. Exactly. Of it. Right. But I feel like in those like extreme expressions, sort of like what we were talking about earlier about like, where is the sobriety? Is it in the bad mood? Is it in the, in the happy mood you know mm. in those extremes it can still be a little uh a little on the pessimistic side right mm. and mm -hmm. i was saying this before we hopped on our call but the thing with scorpio is that like uh the the trust issues that are often very present there are there usually for a reason you know it, it is through these experiences that like lead to these these beliefs that like things aren't safe you know mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah we talk about paranoias and phobias and how much of that is a self-fulfilling prophecy if you're if you're projecting it onto the world right versus yeah, sure. how those same feelings can be protecting us can be can be can be you know mm. guarding us from further harm right right that's a very complex issue too, right um yeah. So it's interesting thinking of like the interplay of like the full depth of Pluto and also that sort of like higher expanded wisdom of Jupiter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. Sort of like I like process, that a lot. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To bring the to bring the Jupiter in there. Um, yeah, you know, like I was saying, in Vedic, they they call they call the. Um, planet jupiter they call him guru that's just his name you yeah. know uh guru because he's representing the teacher and the awakener and the 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 leader the the, the you know yeah. all those bright expansive qualities and uh and i mentioned that in the vedic they have a correlation between this set of stars and the idea of shakti and shakti is a very complex concept but it just means power as it flows in the universe and the guru and the shakti have to be completely in alignment. There can't be, you know, a crack you could slip a paper, a piece of paper into. You couldn't let a ray of sunlight in the distance between the guru and the shakti. They just saturate. The guru becomes absorbed in the big mind, the cosmic power. And that's what gives the guru their power, mm -hmm. right? That's if how they able yeah. So, and then if not, we start to see like the shadow sides of Jupiter or, right. or or gurus in general, you know, that sure. things start to turn dark a little. Sure, sure. There is a there is a horrible dark side to gurus. And I and I and I and that that too is a Scorpio a fucus mystery. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. That's a brilliant observation. Thanks. <laughs> But um, yeah, and 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 we haven't talked. We haven't talked much about Taurus, except to say that if we understood the polarity between Taurus, we like, could help. We it could help us to understand Scorpio Fucus better. But yeah, I'd love to hear what you have to say about Orion because I think there's an yeah. interesting sort of jumping off yeah. point 
the Orion mythology. Yeah, yeah, well, that's a great jump off because Orion and Ephucus are really sort of opposite, where Ephucus was the, the, I mean, we can start with the mythology. Obviously, they're in opposite areas of the sky, they're opposite sides of the sky. And if we take the ecliptic band where the planets travel and we divide the sky, we have Ephucus up here. And then on the other side of the sky, we have Orion down here. So is literally just staring right across with, with our world system in the middle of all that. And Orion, Orion was a very outgoing, very conquering, very proud, very, he was the hunter in, uh, Greco-Roman mythology and Orion Orion was always um like a like a doing figure very action oriented figure like a like whether he was the farmer or the whatever to to Vedic he was the lord of beasts which which is actually a form of Shiva Shiva is Pashupati the lord of beasts so just the lord of nature you just see like Shiva with horns is just like a something like out of Miyazaki's uh, Princess Mononoke like the forest spirit like Shiva is the forest spirit or something so they conceptualize um you could say God is the Godhead. Uh, it's a very different understanding than the West understands. Like, you know, the the Judaic sky god that that war, war god basically. Um, the way the Vedic people understand Shiva is like as consciousness. Shiva sure. is the big mind. It's the awareness, the consciousness of consciousness. It's not, uh, you know anything else at the end of the day everything else is metaphor symbolic but you do have this sort of masculine expression of the divine in in pashupati and orion and you have what was a feminine form of the divine in shakti or fucus and you have this serpent the mastery of this serpent energy because the shakti where where orion was always seen as just the consciousness the awareness that mental acuity the shakti is the power as it flows in the universe and there's there's one infuses the other so consciousness has power and power as it flows in the universe has consciousness and you can't pull them apart at the end of the day but for the sake of trying to understand the mystery that we're in they sort of tried to pull them apart and say well there's shiva and shakti and in the, in the sense that you can do that, to the extent that you can say, well, Shakti is power, it's separate from consciousness, because it isn't. But in the sense you can do that, it's always been depicted as like a, a sort of dragon-like, just like a raw, like this, like a massive serpent. Mm -hmm. And the idea in the in the idea that I love about the sidereal mythology, Rio, is that only with the power of the big mind only with some kind of union to some degree with the divine and god is such a loaded word it's such a culturally weaponized word but let's say call it god call it goddess spirit source energy call it what you like but it's only with that that we can conquer the scorpion because the scorpion likewise is metaphorically our our natures that that seek those the right those intense experiences those dark experiences those catalytic experiences and oh and and so the purpose of all the darkness right is like you were saying i'm bringing this back around right i'm dovetailing back in because you had made a great point that it's it's really all seeking god uh -huh. it's all seeking your own divinity and your own connection with the that indescribable and so that's the circle man that uh, it's a long walk it's a long walk rio but that's that's how i see it relating to orion who is that more active outgoing less mysterious more obvious kind of expression okay yeah for sure i uh i've got a little bit of a take on it it'll bring things down a little more into the mundane level of the cool. process we might, we might benefit from that <laughs> um and it takes things more on the like Western kind of point of view, right? 
but there's mm-hmm. also a connection with uh, the scorpion and Orion, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Because in the Greek mythology, it got to the point where Orion was boasting that he could kill every creature in the woods. That's and right. so instead of like sending a great hero against him, the gods sent the scorpion who took him down. Mm-hmm. And I always mm-hmm. think that this is a really interesting um just sort of concept and one that I come back to when I'm thinking about Scorpio and yeah. to to focus on Taurus for a little bit mm. you know I always sort of talk about Taurus in two different stages on like the first level of Taurus it can be like very much about survival and just like making sure that you really have the basics like is there a roof over your head is there yeah. food on the table you know just right. those uh you know, as a process, making sure that you could just like take care of yourself in the most basic of ways, right? Yeah. And once you got that down, then there's another level of like, can you be like it really is, I think, a process of um like self-reliance, right? Mm -hmm. And so then the next sort of step up is like, um, you know, and it generally has to do with like value systems, what your values are. But also like how do you get really solid about what your values are it's a little bit of a process of like can you become like self-reliant in the relationship you have with yourself can you become really solid with like can you look in the mirror and like yourself can you hang out with yourself alone can you you know just like building that foundation of a relationship with yourself right Mm -hmm. and it's an important process that we all like at some point have to go through right oh, yeah. and then as we like go all the way across right, right, right. across the wheel eventually right. we get to a point where um we get to a point where we we got to take it a step further we got to level up again and at that point like oftentimes a lot of what we need to take down is these like very solidified structures and ideas that we have about ourselves right and these things that we've built up and it can be i think like an ego takedown process Mm, in scorpio mm. of things that were once an important process have now become sort of uh you know they've reached past their point of being useful and now and that's it that's it and and i think the whole port the whole the whole purpose of scorpio you can say scorpio fucus for that matter Every, everything from the beginning of scorpio to the when you pass the galactic center and deal with the you know all that um which is at the end of a fucus the galactic center is at the end of a fucus the everything about it is really just designed to uh clear clear space clear clear away the obsolete it's it's designed to it's like an acid wash right where you, where just what what's you know it's like but to clean something with it it's like where you just eat away all the dirt eat away all the crime you have to it's kind of scorpio creates these pressurized scenarios that sort of force us out of our comfort zone so in taurus we find our comfort zone and we develop yeah. values And in Scorpio, we have experiences that almost antagonize that process. They almost sort of like, they almost sort of force us, They or they challenge it. They'll challenge it. They test it. They'll test it. They'll test it. And I see Scorpio, (laughs) Fucus, and Taurus as oppositions, as as a polarity of signs that are on opposite sides of the sky. I find them to be more antagonistic to each other to each other's processes their processes are more antagonistic to each other than i think any other any other set of polarities you only have six really going around the the wheel the way we use the wheel today and i can't think of another that's just more like scorpio will unwind and undo and challenge yeah. it, it will challenge everything that taurus has built and you made a great observation because when we build these things we need them to take our baby steps we need our training wheels and then you have to take the training wheels off you're not going to learn to ride if you're riding with training wheels and i'm not equating taurus to training wheels. 
but I'm saying that is foundational, you know? It, yeah, it is foundational. And in that, in that sense, there is a correlate you could draw. But what I'm saying is the Taurus represents the things we establish mm -hmm. and Scorpio represents when it's time to move beyond them and let them go. And then we come back again, we come back around from Scorpio, our new, our death and rebirth. And we come back around to that Aries Taurus Gemini process of like re- uh grounding ourselves re you know re-establishing our foundation in the roots and i do think actually that like there is a more embodied quality about like within a few kiss like yeah. in, yeah, yeah, in yeah. Uh, scorpio we're sort of like on as you were saying like unwinding or depending on the situation like blowing apart what needs to be Sure. what needs to happen whereas in a fucus it's sort of it's sort of like the actual portal of like okay like how do i how do at the end of the day you know i feel like a lot of um just like spiritual teachings and practices it's very it's very up and out you know and i find oftentimes yeah. like the mind can be quite uh or like the the mastery of the mind at least is is important but at the end of the day like we are all human we did come here to have this embodied experience and i feel like within a few guests we find some of that mysteries of the actual like fusing of the process mm -hmm. if that makes sense you know yeah, bringing it yeah. bringing it home yeah that's great that's great to 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 sort of I think you covered that. And I, I wanted to jump to maybe talking a little bit about Taurus because we've talked about yeah. what it opposes and antagonizes. And I'd want to give it a little more concrete and frame it in a little more positive terms. In, in other words, what it is mm -hmm. rather than what it does. So I I just, you know, I, I uh, always say Taurus is about stability. Mm -hmm. It's about generating stability. It's about foundations security the buzzwords are like survival and preservation and self-sufficiency but it's about forming a relationship with ourself where we become the pillar that we're leaning on our central pillar that we're a temple and our selfhood or our our relationship with that big mind for some of us because some of us don't make self the central pillar but but at any rate there is a relationship with something indwelling, whether you take it as yourself or the spark of the divine. And at the end of the day, like spoiler alert, it really doesn't matter. They're the same thing. So, mm -hmm. um, but, but conceptually how we organize that, that's what Taurus like stabilizes. It gives us itself appreciation and relationship and understanding self-knowledge so that we have a, a, a crutch. And a solid foundation from which to work on. Or that's not, it. All yeah. wishy washy. And we have personal worth. We have personal value out of that. And Taurus, what it wants to do is just love itself. It's a you you identified a twofold path to Taurus, and I do too. Taurus has Taurus has two processes at hand. It wants to love itself. It seeks to love itself. And it wants to grow its own survivability. It wants to increase its own ability to perpetuate itself into the future. Yeah. That's a, that's a more wordy way of saying it wants to survive. So it wants to love itself and it wants to survive. But everything that goes into survival is like establishing material security, right? Mm -hmm. Establishing everything from that value system to the walls around your fortress. It's Torian. One thing on um, when I get into my like sort of more poetic side, one thing that I always think of when we're talking Taurus too is just this like idea of the Garden of Eden, of like mm -hmm. if we are to pro if we could properly mm -hmm. tend for the space around us, it could provide us absolutely everything we need. You mm -hmm. know, I like, know, I know, I know. It's not in some of that Venusian the garden. Here. It's just, it's just if we could live in some kind of harmonious synchronization with our ecosystem right? like every other stupid animal in the in the kingdom mm -hmm. it, or you know that's the scientific term of kingdoms and, and and genuses and phylums but um 
I don't mean in the kingdom in the Christian sense. I just mean that the the beasts, dumb as they are, have figured out how to their humanity, evidently old enough to have figured out how to live to integrate into their ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah. humanity for all of our genius and agency, we haven't seemingly haven't wrapped our head around that one yet. It's a, it's a too too smart for our own good situation. <laughs> It could be. It really Gotta could keep be. Figuring really. things up, and playing yeah. God, and yeah, yeah, problems we need to solve. Or and it's problems. interesting because you because you talk about Garden of Eden and like and Taurus and in, in the psychological development and the process of psychological development, like following on Aries and moving towards Gemini. Like in Aries, we just had raw impulse, and in Gemini, there's like an organization, and we start to organize uh, our thoughts. Very subtle, so a very subtle level of organization. So in Taurus, the transition between them is obviously. We need to ground and stabilize, and a huge part of what I don't hear talked about in Taurus's process very, very frequently is where we're learning impulse control, because we don't learn that in Aries. We don't. We learn that in early Taurus. Is a huge part of early Taurus is impulse control, so that hangover from Aries gets tempered. And then we finish up Taurus with a full set of skills, right? That's the survivability. Survivability is skills, do you, you know, tools, money is skills you just get of monetizable skills and then we end with that section of the zodiac that is um and let me let me call up i want to show orion just where where orion is relative to this whole thing so when we come around uh so we have capricorn aquarius and here's pisces and here's Aries the bull and Taurus. Here's Orion. Here's Orion down below the ecliptic. Because here's here's Gemini the twins and Cancer. So we have Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, and then you see the beginning of Leo here. And Orion uh sits here the club actually extends up into the ecliptic band so the moon will be like in orion proper and uh and uh astrological traditions that focused on the moon primarily some of them read orion as an astrological constellation so this used to be like or in some cultures you could say it was like more relevant right than it is now just we have this idea of the hunter and the serpent bearer but this is like this gets very deep these uh these relationships mm-hmm. and we have to remember that our star lore and our sidereal mythology is wrapped up in in greco roman six thousand years plus of, of patriarchal white nonsense so we have to keep that in mind we have to understand there's other ways of looking at the sky other constellations other and so when we look at our constellations in the modern western world i always recommend expanding right your education yeah. discover how did uh lakota people look at the stars how did the Diné, and what we call navajo look at the stars how did australian aborigines look at the stars you know it's, it's just discovered the most fascinating correlations mm-hmm. maya good god so i'm sorry i guess i should probably stop it but i do I do just want to point to the exact like opposite placement of Orion here, because again, when we go around, we see a fucus above exactly opposite Scorpius. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I think, I think there's a lot there. I think the heavens are actually very sacred. I think the heavens are actually balanced beyond any kind of coincidental, just like, Oh yeah, the universe just exploded like that. And I think for living in an explosion, we live in an amazingly well organized one. So it's it's really neat when we have when we have when we see these things in the sky relative to our position in the cosmos, and just think like, wow, how my like, god, how fucking sacred is that? It's just amazing. Yeah, for sure. We're yeah. living in a pretty beautiful explosion. <laughs> yeah, amazing, an amazing explosion, Rio. Well, and it's interesting too because in the in the myths. I'm pretty sure like Orion didn't actually die. Right. Like Asclepius saves him, which is another myth that's very like right. worn in or like woven into the 
mythology of Ephucus. Yeah, it is. It is. I didn't. I didn't actually realize that till recently. Ah, right. And so I, it's I interesting. I like the death. Yeah. The death needed to happen, but at the end of the day, like I feel like. Right, right. Like an uh, Osiris kind of, uh, like there was a benefit to it. There was an evolutionary threshold crossed and there was a leap that was made. We all have situations like this in life. We all on occasion like take things too far and then like life, the universe, source, whatever you want to call it, Mm -hmm. will, you know, bring us to our knees and be like, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) You know, and then it can feel like death but then we get up again right right it could even be death i mean in the case of like uh, near death experience some of the most evolutionary evolutionarily catalytic experiences that exist that are on record before and after experiences are people that died and then came back Mm -hmm. it's just compelling stories of life change Yeah, um, I I think I think if we're looking at the polarity, if we're looking at Taurus and we're looking at Scorpio as a polarity, I do want to say you, you brought up uh, some really interesting ways you observed they were similar in interesting ways around uh, around what they desire and how and how they go about uh, getting it. Mm-hmm. And I, I'll leave I'll leave that for you to fill in those blanks. But I I made the observation that they're both stubborn. Yeah, Scorp and Taurus are two of the most stubborn signs in the zodiac. You're not gonna budge these people. Yeah, very true, very true. Um, yeah, they both have a strong like like the Aries Libra thing. They both have a strong sexual nature. They really do express through a lot of desire, a lot of a lot of attraction, desire, energy, a lot of sexual energy. But for the most part, I find them to be really antagonistic to each other. It's not like oppositions in in, in this axis are usually like not easy. They're really hard to reconcile because these are just these processes are very different. Yeah. So, so you you were talking about you were talking about desire and stability and the different ways that they act around that. Do you remember what you were saying? I thought. Yeah, I do think because you know Taurus desires security, and I think that um, like at the end of the day, so does Scorpio. It's much more like emotional sort of process, but they're like looking for commitment. They're looking for their ride or die people. Um, hmm. And it just so happens that like the process that they're that they're going through um, doesn't really doesn't really work out for them. It's almost like it's almost like they need to like see the extremes to to find to find this like magical gem that they're looking for a little bit. Mm, yeah, yeah. The way I the way I was the way I was thinking about it when you had said it the first time off 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 camera before we before we were recording was and then in Taurus we seek inwardly to generate security. We mm-hmm. desire to generate more and more security and in scorpio we desire to increase our security but by testing it's again that that moth to the flame quality we want to test our security on a deep subconscious level maybe but it's one way or another scorpio will will test your security with its death and rebirth urge and i just thought that Mm -hmm. we were talking about the survival Mm-hmm. And how about like in Taurus, it's about the, those like basic building blocks. Like, do you have food? Do you have water? This, that, and the other. Whereas mm-hmm. you were saying mm-hmm. in Scorpio, you find yourself in situations that like. Demand like, spiritual it. power. And they ask, do you have, do you have spiritual power? Do you have insight? Do you have, do you have personal power? Or do you, that's, I, I'm sorry, I finished your sentence, but I just, I what just. What will you a, do to survive is what you said, but. That's it. That's it. That's it. Taurus, we develop a value system and Scorpio, we figure out what we will and won't do to survive, which is the essential definition of a value system. If you break it down, it's what a value system is. It's what you will and won't do to survive. 
So in Scorpio, you see it, the rubber meets the road, right? You get tested mm. and you have to pass fail or, you know, high road, low road, I think. Um, but yeah, Taurus is more inward, more personal, more generative in the sort of foundational sense. You're just generating a kind of kind of thing. Scorpio is where you like commit to more than you can chew and you figure out, oh my God, I just bit off this whole sandwich. I'm going to choke on it, right? How, how am I going to possibly? In Taurus, you're just figuring out what kind of sandwich you like. You're trying what kind of sandwich is that? I love this sandwich. Scorpio, you're like, I don't know, with a side a side of hot fries. Right? Yeah. You should, should never have done that. But but that's how we learn. Yeah. And, you know, we're talking about the ways yeah. they antagonize each other. Like, and these are, these are extreme representations of both. But, like, if Taurus can mm-hmm. be the Garden of Eden, then, yeah. like, a lot of the Scorpio processes can kind of be hell on earth. Oh. Hell on earth. Hell on earth. Yeah, yeah, night and day. And it's not that easy. It's not that easy to just clarify it as like Taurus is good and Scorpio is bad, like Garden yeah, of Eden like... and Hell. But you're not you're not you're not you're pointing to something that's there. Mm-hmm. But but I but it's I also it's not the be all end the... all, but it is no, like no. shades. And even if it was, I think in the garden you get lazy. And when you're out mm-hmm. there in hell on earth, man, you learn to work like a devil. That's what yeah. you do. You have to to prevail. There's no other way to survive except to show up and 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 overcome and there's no way to do that without tapping into those uh, mystical resources right energetically let's say these like conscious and energy resources from beyond our own limits beyond the boundaries of us who we are we can tap into you know, it's like riding a wave you know if i'm swimming into shore i'm not going to get there but if i can if i can you know catch a wave then and it's a big wave i mean we're talking in a fuca scorpio we're talking about catching a very big wave right the kind of wave that'll really crush you until you learn to to balance to to, to do that thing mm-hmm and i mean so it's interesting all kind of metaphors some of my metaphors are better than others but that's what you say Ria? um i do you know i mentioned that i think there is more of an embodied quality to a fucus i think that that's a similarity that they have you know um because they've been like so fused for so long you know Scorpio does get mm. the get the reputation for like being very sexual and I kind of mm. think that like within the actual processes there's a little bit more of the like survival emotional extreme levels in Scorpio and it kind of takes mm. that like ease mm. off like <sighs> sort of breath of fresh air that comes in a fucus to really start mm. to like bring more of the like sexuality theme in a little bit yeah, yeah, and i think yeah. that that's that at least like the there's like a, a kind of matching like sensuality between a fucus and taurus we're gonna bring up yeah things that yeah. are similar that's an interesting way of looking at the way that the two signs work together because you know they obviously work together as, as opposites but when they can come together and kind of make that harmony that alchemy mm-hmm. that's really a neat observation yeah. Now, and with a fucus, I think it's it's uh, like a little bit more energetic, and with Taurus, it's more about like that actual sensual, like I'm in a body sort of experience. But I do think there is a little bit more of an embodied. It's like the fusion in a fucus of like, oh yeah, I'm both. You know, mm-hmm. I'm God and human. At yeah. One. Yeah. And yeah. It, and it works. It's interesting. A thought just jumped into my mind. It's not it's not really that this thought is in direct response to what you just said, but what you just said put me in mind of it, which is I had talked earlier and you agreed that the uh, sign Scorpio, a fucus, the eighth house, and Pluto are just terribly hard to understand because it's a bunch of stuff that all gets lumped together that it doesn't seem like it goes together. And as close as I can tell, what draws all that stuff in under one umbrella is that it's all having to do 
with the transition from the Libra stage to the Sagittarius stage. And in the Libra stage, we're we're seeking to understand ourselves through that the other people. Mm-hmm. We're 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 having experiences with relationship and one-on-one relationship where we learn basically how people are different than us. We form relationships with those people we like, but in in order to get to that Sagittarian, like that real like takeoff, that like next level vista. Because Sag starts a whole new process. And then right after we pass the GC, Sag starts just this totally, it's fundamentally different part of the Zodiac, Sag through Pisces. But without wanting to get into all that, I want to just stay on point and say that the eighth house, and Scorpio Fucus, all the things that it rules are things that, from the world of relationships, have to do with um coming through that commitment and intimacy process into that like real cauldron of real alchemy that 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 crucible that Scorpio generates for us and making us ready for our our own sort of personal truth making us making us ready and and there has to be there's a sort of a I don't want to say a naiveness to Libra, although there is. Literally, there is a naiveness to Libra. It's, it's a little known for it. It's not always a problem, but you you do have just a sort of like kind of heady, like almost like ivory tower approach to things. And in order for the truth, I think, to really be expressed, be just real, we we have to be, we have to really be tempered and go deeper. Mm-hmm. And the and the way Scorpio Fucus acts is through all of those catalysts, all the intense catalysts that we listed: sex, and magic, alchemy, all kind of transformations through, you know, intimacy and power and powerlessness. Everything that's not allowed to be talked about in polite society right because polite society that's taurus that's a taurus thing we want to protect the value system right we want to we want to stabilize we need that social security and everything that we start to think about in scorpio fucus like undermines that so yeah the, say- the process i just wanted to i just wanted to bring this around more for the benefit of people listening than than for you but just to say that all the weird stuff in the eighth house i do see it as stuff that is needed to get from that first stage of just coming out of our shell that libra represents and that sort of social emergence to get from there to our truth mm-hmm. the sagittarius to capital truth to, to really what's true in the world there just has to be a, a deep and testing and tempering process. Hmm. And and all the stra- all the straggling stuff that gets under that umbrella, I think it's related. It's related to that seventh to ninth house dynamic. Hmm. Well, and I think there's like a deeper sort of spiritual process at play in Libra you know, and, and folks can go back to our Libra video if you want to dive in deeper to this, but, you know, yeah. we've got the, um, the correlations with the way in the heart against the feather, the correlations between Libra and judgment. I feel like there is like, there is a pretty big correlation in Libra to this truth. And it's almost like, Mm. almost like epiphany Mm -hmm. moment of like oh i see the truth you know but then right then there's the actual real life process of how do i get in integrity with right how do i model that truth yeah how How do i I live out of that truth that's it that's That's a whole messy process you're just it's just so on point with these observations today yeah 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 awesome awesome that's it that's it there is there is a kernel of what sag becomes in and it's the jupiter venus connection there's there's a goodness and there's a there's a an idealism in in libra the buzzword is idealism which i correlate maybe unhelpfully with naivety but within that idealism is the ideal 
it is the highest, the pinnacle, the the big T truth that we want to work towards. But we can't just seemingly we can't yeah. just show up like, hey, I understand the truth. Sign me up, coach. Right? Like, throw it, me exactly. In. We got to actually like yeah. take the steps. What does that look like? Yeah, on your laps. <laughs> Sometimes an entire life reorganizing. <laughs> Some people's lifetimes are, are defined by that sort of lap running. It's true. It's true. Yeah, it gets very serious. I don't want to laugh too glibly. We're in we're in territory that gets volatile very quickly. Mm-hmm. So I want to be very respectful of that because this is a defining energy in some people's lives. Mm-hmm. Very true. But really, I think we've talked about everything that I had in my notes, and I feel I feel really like just talking a little about Taurus and that and that need to generate good self relationship, good self values, a good value system, and then outwardly to just learn to survive. Mm-hmm. Everything from wealth and accumulating resources to procreation is all Taurian. Everything that perpetuates something into the future, Doris. Everything that cuts it down at the root just to see what it's made of, what's really going to sh- sprout. <laughs> what's really going to sprout when you're done with that. All that is, all that is Scorpio Fugues. So pretty interesting stuff. I really am glad we got to take the time and talk about some of the just overwhelmingly weird complexities some stuff that just doesn't make sense not not at first glance it took me a long time and i hear the feedback from young astrology students that is just a confusion point for sure especially when we start to like bring just like a general eighth house stuff in then it's like and and then now the way we deal with it we're talking about scorpio fucus we're expanding on the mythology and the and the and the and the and the the archetype of this already confusing archetype i do i do personally think there's a little bit more like difference to it but also i'm like hesitant to draw conclusions because i feel like i'm still very much in my like data gathering experiential phase oh cool yeah we we might have this yeah 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 bless we might have this conversation in like two years and be a totally different conversation our ideas may have changed you know and we we have certainly evolved uh and we'll probably not stop doing that so i i you know with all respect to what you're saying which is great respect i just feel in a way, I I hope that'll always be the case. I'll always be learning and ch- and 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 changing my perspective, deepening and evolving my perspective in accord with new information mm-hmm. that that comes like because that's 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 science. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Nice. Well, do you think we're running almost two hours now? Do you think there's anything? Oh wow, we got almost two hours. No, let's let's uh, let's call it a podcast, Rio. That was awesome. Let's do it. Right. Do you have anything that you'd like to share with people? Anything you're up to? We already said you're getting back. In the- uh, right. No, no. I've just spent the last couple of weeks and months moving house. And I'm in, I'm in a really delightful, uh, cozy house with, with the person I love very much. And everything is, uh, feels, feels a little like I'm winning for the moment, but I'm exhausted and I, I don't, I'm taking the rest of the year off. I'm like in some days, like yesterday, I could barely stay awake all day. And, um, yeah, that's what naps are for. It's not a big deal, but it's not like I'm just itching, raring to get back to work. So um right. I'm starting to see I'm starting to see some clients uh finally make up some of the sessions. But and I'll be back uh next month, uh that's January 2023, with uh, the continuation of the lunar cycle report. Um as always, to anyone who's interested in this kind of astrology or these ideas or just meeting some people who might, you know, have a different way of thinking about things, come find us on Facebook uh, on the Sidereal Revolution. I'm always up to that. Um, it's the spot. It's the place to be if you're interested in this stuff. It is, kids. All the other kids are doing it. They're just not telling you about it everyone's doing it although I will say the one thing that I have always I've almost like gotten out of pretty much all the other astrology groups on Facebook and I love Teddy Real because you know it's just filled with people who are genuinely like 
really excited to learn and to learn in depth you know so if you want an astrology group that's not going to be all like memes and stereotypes oh yeah I guess it. Yeah. yeah it's a good every once in a while it can be it can be a, a it can be a caricature of itself in a, in, a, in a way that doesn't bother me but I think I think everything can and yeah, I, I think it's one of the best groups out there for just for just genuine, open-minded, actual yeah. forensic discussion. Like, let's discover what's Curiosity, going on. Curiosity, you know. Curiosity mm-hmm. rules. Yeah. So, so we're all, you know, we're all um, on a learning journey together, and that's that's where a lot of us convene. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, I don't I don't have anything outstanding to say. Ria. How about you? You up to you get news for the people. I got a calendar that will be cutting it real close, but when I got what when I got all the artwork done, I'll put the uh I'll put the link up. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah, your calendars Mars are and, awesome. This Mars and Taurus planner, sidereal planner, and uh and uh and this what like a day calendar. Well, uh, I'm I'm back to I'm just gonna do the original format. I was trying okay. to I was trying to make things more. Uh, I was like, if I do it like this, I'll be able to do it quicker. And then my mm-hmm. partner actually pointed out to me, he's like, you're dreading all of this computer work. Why don't you just do it the way that you did it last time? I was like, you know what? You're right. I'm just going to do it that way. So yeah, it'll be, yeah. A, it'll be a calendar with a bunch of data almost in, well, for the midpoint version, it will be uh, Maria from Sidereal Revolution has done all my data. Is my... Oh, cool angel who has saved me yeah 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 well cool that's that's a really nice angel to have yeah if anyone orders and um i do have the pre-sale link so i'll put that down in the notes but that's about it for me yeah you should you should been pretty much on uh, hiatus too (laughs) right yeah yeah we've it's been a slow it's been a slow season well Mars retrograde in Taurus. Let's just lean into it. Have the nap. Sure. Sure, yeah. sure. That's the spirit. I'm going to go take one now. Yeah. No, well, it's, it's, thank you so much for being here today and having this discussion. You're so welcome. Yeah. 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 Always awesome, Rio. Thanks. To, thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, everyone out there. All yeah. the Watching. And we'll, and viewers. It's Ash season. Will that be our last video? We started Cancer, right? Sad Gemini. Did we start in Cancer Capricorn? Uh, I think so. I don't know. Or did we start yeah, in we'll Leo? To... We, we did. did. We, we did. We did. we did. We did start in Leo. I do believe we did. All right. All okay. right. Thanks. Good Thank thing you. we Thanks know what's going on, Rio. That makes that makes it that makes it official. <laughs> <laughs> right. We should have a podcast. We should talk about astrology. Like we should. Hey, wait a minute. Oh, hold on a second. <laughs> All right. Well, All right. good night, it's everyone. Time, <laughs> it's time to wrap it up. That's enough from me. Thank you, everyone. Bless you.